Okay, I think it's time to start. Um, welcome again, everybody, to our Smart Water Mentorship Series. Uh, this is our second episode, and we're featuring Dr. Joe Burgess from Our Utilities. So we welcome you to the session. Um, a reminder that we ask you to keep your Q, uh, questions to the Q&A box and then any other comments are welcome in the chat and feel free to post uh, while the session is going. We'll get to your questions at the end or if we miss them we will promise to answer them in our LinkedIn group after the session. So welcome, we are uh, RISP, that's Rising Smart Water Professionals. We are the Young Professionals uh, Leadership Committee for SWAN Forum. And I'm sure you've all heard of the SWAN Forum. It's an amazing network. Look at all their Smart Water Hub partners. And um, it's a worldwide network of uh, um, uh, utilities and companies and academia and all sorts of businesses in the smart water industry. And to create a network to support each other and to um, provide assistance in developing the smart water industry. So here is our uh, RISP leadership team. Uh, today, we have Lisa with us on the call, but the others are helping out uh, in the background, creating other interesting programs. Emma is our team lead. Jessica is working on, an, sorry, Mohundan is working on a knowledge man management uh, system. Lisa on an ambassador program, which you'll hear a bit more about towards the end. And Jessica on the, um, also on mentorship and job creations for young professionals. So as a team, we aim to support the young professionals in, in smart water and um, create interesting opportunities for you. Uh, and this mentorship program is one of those. So let me tell you a little bit more about our smart water mentorship program. We have selected an interview process for our launch of our mentorship program. We hope to develop this further into a more comprehensive program later on. But for now, we'd like to interview amazing smart water professionals, people you may not have access to, you know, within your uh, physical reach. That's why we've gone worldwide with our, with our look, our search for, for mentors. And uh, today's mentor is a good example of that. She's all the way from South Africa and, um, the aim of these interviews is really to focus on career and life advice. Things that are not necessarily like technical in nature, they're not going to answer your design question, but they may give you guidance on where to take your career next, where you may uh, find inspiration um, both now and in the future. And that's why we're recording these interviews and they'll form a library on our website so that you can refer back to them at any time and maybe something different in the mentor's advice will resonate with you in future. So this whole concept has taken inspiration from Tim Ferriss's book, Tribe of Mentors. So this is our version of building a tribe of mentors for smart water professionals specifically. Because our industry is growing so fast, it's really important to attract young professionals to this industry and help this industry grow. And this is our way of doing it. We're creating a, this library and a community. And so please also follow us on, on LinkedIn group and, and to hear more about all these initiatives that we're doing for our RISPers. If you have any further questions about our mentor series, feel free to put them into the Q&A box and we will also ask for those. But now without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jo Burgess. She's a senior technology consultant at Owl Utilities. And um, we're going to jump right in. She's sorry, she's based in Pretoria. And um, I'd like to jump right in to hear a bit more about what she does. So we're starting the event with a couple of uh, icebreaker questions. They're called rapid fire questions. And so um, this is just to give you an idea of what uh, Dr. Burgess's personality is like. So she's gonna answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Welcome Dr. Joe Burgess. Hi Rudy, thank you for having me. 
It's such a pleasure to have you here. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen because we all want to see your face. There we go. That's a bit better. <laughs> so we've got seven, seven rapid fire questions. Um, and yes, whatever comes to mind, please feel free to fire away. Number one is, please complete the sentence. Smart water is? Efficient. Efficient. That's an interesting observation. Definitely, I agree with that. The second one, what do people often get wrong about you? Oh, until they've met me, my gender, um, particularly because Joe is a, a boy's name as well as a girl's name and the industry is, the water industry is quite male dominated. So until they meet me, a lot of people are expecting a man. I completely agree with that. It happens to me too. <laughs> of course. Um, one of your favourite books? Is a Stephen King novel called The Stand. Um, it's a trashy novel. Absolutely, absolutely no mental heavy lifting involved in reading it at all, but it's really well written. Um, he was an associate professor of English as well as a, a novelist. And I love the way he chooses words and in this particular trashy novel, it's quite reflective on how wonderful and terrible humans can be all at the same time. <laughs> Sounds interesting, I'll give it a read. <laughs> um, which is one must have part of your typical work day? Ooh, on the work side, I try and do a big thing. So one big thing that's about a four hour job, then two medium things that are hour to two hours and then a whole lot of small things and that's just sort of checking your email and and all that kind of stuff um but outside of the the tasks then exercise and coffee <laughs> exercise and coffee that sounds, sounds like a good combo and um what is on your nightstand um right now a battery alarm clock thanks to escom for the rolling blackouts um a water bottle my spectacles because I'm old now and a lamp. <laughs> yes, definitely a battery operated. <laughs> <It'll> be <laughs> yeah. solar in future. <laughs> yes, yeah, these are, um, I have a solar gorilla to charge the batteries and they're rechargeable batteries. Ah, very impressive. And uh, what is a snapshot of an ordinary moment in your life that brings you true joy? The sunrise, a new day is always a, a blessing and a gift. Um, the phone ringing and you pick it up and you see it's someone you love, their name on the screen, or at work, closure on a task or a project that I think went well and I'm pleased to send out the result or publish the result. Um, but on a smaller scale, new knowledge or new understanding. If you grasp something for the first time, then that's a joyful moment. Yes, I, I completely agree with that last one. And that's really what we're hoping to achieve here with your insights. I'm sure it will resonate with some of our uh, young, young water professionals. And lastly, what is your latest curiosity? Oh, because vaccines and trials have been in the news and I'm participating in a trial as well, it would have to be the placebo effect because it is a lot more complicated than I thought. Oh. Um, hopefully we get to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. Would you like to tell us more about that? Um, sure, I'm in the phase three trial for the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine, um, or the vaccine candidate, it hasn't been authorised yet. And in finding out that it's a quadruple blind trial and learning a little more about the placebo effect, I also learned that um, pills and injections work on people even if they know it's a placebo. So that really interested me and I started to read a, a lot more into, into that. Um, but the COVID-19 vaccine, the one I'm doing at the moment, um, I think is particularly interesting because it's a, a DNA-based vaccine, not an mRNA-based vaccine. So unlike the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, it doesn't need to be stored at minus 70. Um, and in the part of the world where I am, you can reach people in rural areas much more easily. It just needs to be kept at fridge temperature. Um, and you only need a single injection. So you can go into a rural area, vaccinate everybody who's willing to take the vaccine, although vaccine hesitancy isn't so common here as in some countries, um, and leave again and you're done. You don't have to keep a register of who had it when and go back in the right time frame and re-inoculate the right people. And it just makes it a lot easier to reach vulnerable communities. Um, so I'm hoping for really good data. The, 
they should be publishing their results next week. Wow, very, very interesting. I'll definitely be following, hopefully you share it with us on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, thank you, Joe, for a little bit of background of uh, yourself and, and what's been interesting to you lately. I'm now going to uh, move on to the uh, proper interview questions. Um, we would love if you elaborate as much as you like about anything that comes to mind. We really are just providing guideline questions to, to hear your, your career story and any advice you have for our, our whispers. So the first question, are there any significant people or events that helped to get you to where you are now in your career as a smart water professional? Yeah, absolutely. If you, I think any of us, if you ask anybody if there's anything that they achieved completely alone, with no support, no help, no input, no guidance from anybody else. I don't think there's anybody who, who's managed that. Even if somebody heard your woes, let you cry on them, didn't give you any technical input at all, but it's impossible to do something completely alone. So in chronological order, um, then I'd have to go back to my grandparents, I think, because I'm the first person in my, my family to have had a, a tertiary education. Um, my grandma was a domestic, a maid, and she wanted to be completely sure that her children wouldn't have to do the same kind of work that she did. So she made sure my mum, her daughter, um, stayed in school until she was 16. And when she left school, she went and got an office job. Similar to my grandma, my mum wanted something more for me than, than what she had. So she pushed me to, to finish school, to do A-levels or matric. Um, and that really set me on the path into getting a higher education and sort of not breaking out of the cycle of poverty. I, I won't be as melodramatic as that, but it's, it's a true story for a lot of families, um, not only in South Africa, but I mean, my grandparents and, and parents are all in the UK. And there are plenty of examples where students of mine have also gone from working in domestic service a generation or two generations ago to achieving their doctorate and getting a a professional career and I don't think you can do that without at least some support from somebody in your family it might not be your parents and um, it might be your friend's parents or it might be an aunt or it might be a cousin somebody in your own age group who just sees you and says I think you have more potential than this and I think you should go for it it's an extremely difficult choice to make when you're just a child basically so if you don't have somebody behind you um, you probably won't take that step Going from there, obviously, I had some some awful lecturers, but I had some great lecturers as well. People who were completely passionate about their subject and could take something as, as daunting to me as statistics and turn it into something I actually wanted to learn about. They made it interesting and, and possible to learn. And those people were, were great people. They were in completely the right professions. They were amazing teachers and imparters of knowledge. And without them, it would be much harder to, to take those steps through the education system and, and to come out with a, a qualification at the end. I think the first individual significant person professionally um, that helped me was my PhD supervisor. And not even because of his technical knowledge, even though he is the most phenomenal chemical engineer, but because of the way he went about things. He was always extremely generous with his time to his students and with his knowledge, not only to his students, but everyone else. And there are some people who get to the top of their profession by being very, um, guarding what they know very jealously and not wanting to share any information that they have and seeing it as an advantage that they have over someone else. You know, I know something you don't. And he wasn't like that at all. He would tell anybody any information that they asked for and explain it five ways until they understood it. And he still rose to the top of, of the industry in the UK, which is where his career has been all these years. And in doing that, he's not only risen to the top and he's one of the most successful people in the water industry, but he's also really universally liked and respected. People will go to him for advice and they want to collaborate. They approach his university to work with him on projects and on, on proposals. And it brings him a range of opportunities that he wouldn't have otherwise, but I didn't have that perspective when I was just a, a student. I was just glad he would answer my questions and listen to me, no matter how dumb my questions were. Um, 
but the way he conducted himself he turned out to be the most incredible role model and some of the best pieces of advice I've ever received came from him so he said to me do one thing one big thing every year that frightens you and it can be in your your private life you can go and do a bungee jump if you're afraid of heights or you can apply for a job that you think is a bit beyond you or you can move country or just just do one thing each year that keeps you out of the rut of just doing the same old. And that was, was better advice than I knew at the time. Um, one of the other things he told me was that advice was free and you don't have to take it. So it's always optional. And to not take advice from somebody who, from whom you wouldn't take criticism. And that was a, a really good piece of advice as well. So if it's someone whose opinion you don't value, for whatever reason, if you think they've made poor errors of judgment in the past by all means listen to their advice it's free um, but you don't have to take it and he was he was right he was really right about those things since then I would have to say I've been really lucky in that I really enjoyed my my first job you'll probably have several jobs in your career and I think it's really important that you enjoy the first one um, it's probably important that you enjoy the last one I'm lucky enough that I enjoy I've enjoyed all my jobs so far but my first boss was a very um, similarly generous and guiding person, also incredibly good. Um, she, was, she is a virologist and I learned a ton of stuff from her without really realizing I was picking it up. Um, but she was also one of these very sort of supporting leaders, um, definitely a, a service leadership model. And that has stayed with me as well. It, it's definitely the way to conduct yourself in the, the professional um, workplace. So I find not asking anything of anybody that I wouldn't do myself is a good way to go. And just being there to help. And she always said that she worked for all the people below her and she's an academic. So she says she works for her students and she's absolutely right. She's dead right. Just having that um, set of role models for the way you act in a professional setting the way you network at conferences, for example, you can go to the gala dinner, you know, when we have physical conferences again, and be social and be popular, but understand that it's a professional setting and your future employers are probably watching you. So don't get drunk on the dance floor kind of thing. It was invaluable. And it's just something you pick up through osmosis from the people you're around. So that I think has paid dividends in terms of what happened in later positions where perhaps my job's um, took me to bosses that weren't that professional or weren't that supportive of their staff and it gives you enough of a range of experiences that you can you can look at somebody who's doing something a particular way and then look back at your previous experience and go actually I know of a better way of doing that and I'm not going to follow, follow the model in my current day job because I don't think that is the right way to do it so it's really significant. Oh, thanks, Jo. Wow, there's uh, a lot of inspiring people uh, that have been part of your um, career growth, and, and that's yeah. very good to hear. Uh, very important in terms of emphasizing um, mentorship uh, in our uh, smart water industry, and um, very. there were so many nuggets there that <laughs> of advice <laughs> that I don't know what you're going to answer to our advice question now. <laughs> But uh, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of there, but I'm curious to know what, what one big thing you did last year in amongst all this COVID craziness. The big thing I did last year, okay, along with, obviously not alone because you don't do things alone, along with the chairman of, the, of my, my company, the IELT Group, we launched a crisis response platform, um, not only for COVID-19, but against things like the Beirut disaster, and it takes up a huge amount of time and it was terribly frightening. We undertook to do weekly webinars at the beginning of the pandemic and inform the water sector around the world of how to shut down safely, how to keep their staff safe when they're working alone, how to respond to the mental health crisis of everybody suddenly being isolated, how to reopen vacant bu buildings safely, whether or not SARS-CoV-2 would survive in water and wastewater. And it was, it was frankly terrifying. Within a month, we had a thousand people tuning into the webinars. We did them for free and we work on billable hours. So we had to work out how the organization was going to survive. Um, and I had to dredge all that virology knowledge from 15 years ago. 
back to the front of my mind and go on a really steep learning curve so that I could understand the academic literature and then explain the implications for water companies and say, you know, this is what's going to happen to your water demand. And with hindsight, it's obvious, but more people are using water at home and fewer companies are using water. So demand's going to increase and revenue is going to decrease. And there must be ways we can operate more effectively to do that. And then go online in a forum like this one and do a live webinar to a thousand or so people that know the water industry and their, their own company's operations better than I do. And, you know, pretend to give them advice and pretend as if I knew what I was doing. And it was petrifying. Um, but it was so, so worthwhile. People came forward with things that they'd learned. And very soon it became this massive collaborative platform with sort of 600 organizations going, well, actually we did a board paper on how we're gonna recover and we'll share it with everyone. And this is how we reopened our building. And actually we found this technology and it just became the most collegial supportive group. It was like a self-help group for the water industry in no time at all. We're still doing it. And we're only doing it once a month now because things thankfully have, have slowed down a little bit, but we are still doing it and it does still have value, but it still frightens me every time we do it. And whenever I present something and go, this is a preprint, but I think it's going to get through peer review. I don't think we need to worry about SARS-CoV-2 being persistent and, and infectious in river water. And here's my reasons why. And knowing that some people in that audience are going to go back to work and go, we don't need to worry about it in river water. And they're just going to take my word for it. That terrifies me. So you have to be confident that you understand why you're saying what you're saying. But it was awesome. It was amazing. Wow, oh, that sounds incredible to, to be sort of uh, experience scary. that. <laughs> scary, yes, but incredibly brave as well. And uh, as you said, doing it with confidence meant people believed you, but you also had your facts to back it up. That's uh, incredibly important. Thank you, yeah. Joe, for that inspiring big thing. <laughs> I'm going to try to do a big <laughs> thing like that this year for now, but I don't know if I'll meet that. <laughs> I haven't I, done the uh, bungee jump yet. <laughs> oh, okay, I have done it. <laughs> um, uh, no, it sounds like what you've done is, is far, far more incredible and I've definitely touched many more lives. I'm going to ask you the second question now. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? This could be an investment of money or time or energy or anything that you think. Um. A network very much like this one. I volunteered in the young water professionals starting in, oh lord I am so old, 1999 when I was still a student and it became one of the most worthwhile things I've ever done. Definitely the lesson from that is if if somebody asks you to volunteer for something just say yes and then work out how you're going to do it later. Um, it's taken, I don't know how many thousands of hours over the years I was doing it. Obviously, I am not young anymore. So I'm not in the young water professionals anymore, but I helped build the UK and then the South Africa chapters. The South Africa chapter is now about 10,000 or so members. It took thousands of hours. And that was another very scary thing because we started it with 500 rands, which is, um, I don't know what that is in a range of other currencies, but it's really not very much money. And half of it was mine and half of it belonged to the other co-founder. Um, but it was completely worth it. I mean, we worked our socks off. We worked evenings and weekends. We set up conferences. We set up networks. We, we gave it to parents. So the International Water Association on the one hand and the Water Institute of Southern Africa on the other, which on the face of it are competing organizations, but they don't have to be. Um, so again, it's much better not to do things alone. And it was absolutely worth it. It made doors open to us that would never have opened before. It gave all of the people involved in starting it up and, and we became a little group from two to four. And then suddenly you're not just a lone nutcase, you have a, a group of people. And then more people want to join because it's a good group, it's a fun group and it's doing worthwhile things. And then suddenly you have an organization and that becomes a movement. And then it's often running by itself and you don't have to push it along all the time it takes on the energy of the crowd so it it drains your time away from you but it gives you everything in the world back it gives you an immediate network 
um, through the IWA and through through WESA and through any organization like that, any professional body. And once you start having events and providing services to other people in your peer group, the way you guys are actually, then people notice and they start to, if you're doing a good job, they start to trust you and they start to ask you to do more things. So I can't remember who exactly what the quote is, but Thomas Edison said something about new opportunities always come dressed in work clothes and it's absolutely right, they do. Somebody comes and asks you to do something and it means more work for you, but it also means more experience for you. It means new people you wouldn't otherwise have met. It means the opportunity to get exposed to different ways of achieving the same end, the same outcome, and ways in which you see a method that you used before can be used to achieve something different. So it just take, lifts off your learning curve at, at the point when you, you're a young professional and it exposes you to a much broader range of experience than you could ever have had just by going to work and doing your job and going home again. So massive investment of time and energy, but totally, totally worth it. And if you get a chance, anybody in the audience gets a chance to volunteer for any of these kind of SWAN type risk, IWA, whatever networks, absolutely go for it and grab it with both hands. It is completely worthwhile. That is one of the best introductions to what I'm going to advertise now, which is our ambassador program. <laughs> We're inviting applicants to apply for our ambassador program at RISP. And uh, Lisa will tell you a bit more about it at the end of our session, but uh, maybe she can post Richard. something in the chat in the meantime. Thank you, Joe. Um, next up, question three. What is the most important leadership lesson you've learned and how has it proven invaluable? Um, to echo what I said before, not ask anybody to do something you wouldn't do yourself. That doesn't mean you have to be able to do everyone else's job. I mean, I work in an organisation that creates small project teams for each individual project that we do, made up of the expertise that's required. And I, for example, I am not a civil engineer. So it doesn't mean if I ask somebody in my team to undertake a civil engineering task that I could do it but I would do it. I'm not asking for the impossible. I'm not asking for something to be done by 1 a.m. Um, I wouldn't expect somebody to do something that I'm not willing to do. If you, have an if you are interested in setting up your own business, let me say it with words I can pronounce, that can be a little bit dangerous because if you're the owner of the company, then obviously you're willing to work 16 hours a day for six days a week for 10 years to make your company work. And you can't expect that from your employees. But that doesn't mean you can't ask for tasks to be performed that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself if you had the expertise or if you had the time to do it. And the other thing that I've learned actually from people that I've, I've named so far, people in, in my past, is that as you climb your career ladder or you climb the education ladder, as you step up onto each rung, it doesn't hurt you at all to lean down and help the people on the rung behind you. So whether they're behind you in their particular development journey or they're simply younger than you it doesn't matter it will always pay back dividends even if you want to be completely selfish about it to you personally but it just uplifts the sector as a whole to help the people behind you and all the people I've worked with all the leaders I've worked with whether they've been project team leaders or the owners of the company or heads of academic departments all the good ones have had that in common where they've had that willingness to sit down with somebody who's maybe five years younger or two years behind them in their own development journey and just share with them what they've gained or what they've learned along the way. So it's always worth being generous with your time and knowledge. It might not be why you do it, but it will come back to you. Um, when you need help, for example, people will help you if they see that you're willing to do that for other people and you can never succeed alone. So you will have to ask for help um, from people at some point. When it comes to sort of leadership service and, and leading by example, that's really important. I think it's not only unfair to ask somebody to do something you wouldn't do, but it's also unfair to ask them if they don't know how to do it, unless you're willing to explain what you need and be really clear about that explanation. So communicating very clearly to the people that you're asking to do things, um, even if you feel bad about it, and I do tend to feel quite bad about it, um, 
it's what people need. It's certainly what I want. If I go to my boss and, and they don't explain clearly what I'm supposed to do and, and why it's important, then I find it much harder to perform a task. So it's important to understand that if you're in a position of leadership, then you have to explain very clearly what you want um, and why you want it, if asked for that too. Thanks, Jo. Um, I think I definitely resonate with both of those things. So my first time managing somebody last year and also found explaining things clearly is, is quite challenging when you haven't done it before. Yeah. Um, and nobody mm -hmm. teaches you. It, you don't get trained. You're just expected to, now you're an engineer or now you're a professional scientist. These people are going to report to you and you're just are supposed to pick up how to do that. And it's, it's not easy. It's not trivial. Absolutely. Um, and for our fourth question, uh, what advice would you give to a smart, driven, inspired, rising professional or graduate about to enter the smart water worlds? Is there any bad advice that they should ignore? You've already oh, heard definitely. some, but <laughs> some more, I'm <laughs> Absolutely. sure. <laughs> any, I'm going to start with the last bit. Um, if you, you often see them on social media, particularly LinkedIn is a terrible place for this but any sort of by the time you're 30 you should have you know a list of experiences or, or a particular financial target or something just that's garbage ignore that everybody moves at their own pace and a lot of people um depending on the the baseline that they're coming from so they might come from a disadvantaged community or simply a poor family or for whatever reason they might have changed career late in life if you tell somebody who only got their degree when they were 45 that by 30 they should have done all these things, that's just going to dishearten them. And I hate those lists with an absolute passion. Everyone's journey is different. Everybody qualifies at a different age. I've got a really good friend who studied for seven years to become an architect, practiced for a year, hated it, and took an incredibly brave decision, I think, to go and do something completely different. So he didn't qualify again until he was, I think, 35. And it's just insulting to somebody who's had the, the courage to change course, to tell them that they should, they're should they only now reaching a point where they should have been 15 years ago. Um, so I really hate those. Some of the things in the list are a good idea, but I don't think it's wise to go, you should do this before you're 25 or anything along those lines. Um, so, okay, back to the good advice. It's people will notice what you do. They'll, they'll listen to what you say, but they'll forget. So let your actions speak. It's much more important for you to give credit to others wherever it's due. Um, and rather than sort of seeking the exposure or the praise or the credit that you're due, even if you are due it, just keep quiet and let your history speak. Because by the time you've been in your position for, let's say a year and a half, two years, you will have consolidated a reputation within your organization. So whether you've turned out to be somebody who bragged, you know, to everybody who would stand still for long enough about the one thing you did that was good, or whether you're somebody who turned out five good things in the last, you know, 12 months, and actually people are coming back now and asking for more work from you, the people above you and the people around you will notice the difference. So don't worry if at the early point in the early few years of your career, you think you're not getting noticed, believe me, you are because people choose very carefully who they want to work with again in future and who they will turn to for support on a project to collaborate with, to work with. If you make too much noise and don't deliver enough, then those doors will remain closed um, as you, you move through the rest of your career. In your day job, you're going to need a coach. Um, nobody knows everything. Absolutely nobody knows everything, no matter how much experience they have and how old they are. So for the technical side of things, the how do I sort of nuts and bolts, find somebody whose opinion you trust. And even if they don't know the answer, if they're the right kind of person, they will work through the problem with you. And between you, you will find the right technical answer. And then spot yourself a mentor. Um, and that doesn't have to be in your day job. In fact, it's better if it's somebody outside. And then the, the conversation between how do I achieve a particular thing work through a diff difficult calculation, do a design, can be completely different from the 
how do I go about this particular situation time type of conversation that you have with a mentor so I think find someone you trust or more than one person that you trust is is important let your actions speak for you um, and just always do your best even if if you think it's not good enough um, and often you will think it's not good enough imposter syndrome is true for everybody then the fact that you did your best will take you much much further than if you just put something together because you weren't sure what you're doing and went good enough and um, so those are the pieces of advice that I would give. Thanks so much Joe. Um, I think lots of lots of good nuggets in there for everybody to find something particular. Um, you mentioned mentors are very important and my next question is do you have a mentor or have you had a mentor and if so what role did they play in your career and were they younger or older? Okay um I do have a mentor and I have had plenty of mentors actually um but they didn't know the best thing about picking a mentor is that you can do it through a, a formal scheme where you have an official mentor protege relationship but you don't have to you can identify somebody that you think has attributes that you admire or has achieved a position whether it's professionally or reputationally that you aspire to and then you can observe them you can also engage them in conversation it can be people you know personally it can be people that you know by reputation it doesn't really matter um i've had a mixture so people i've watched and decided that actually that's a really good way to go about things and they can be technical people or not so one of the the people i watch at the moment for example is angela merkel um, anyone in europe and probably beyond will know she's the current chancellor of germany and i think the way that she answers technical questions the way she talks with her hands um I also love the fact that she's got no control over her facial expressions so she rolls her eyes at Donald Trump all the time and I think those are good attributes to have so I, th I, th I think she's a good role model but I don't have access to speak to her obviously except maybe on Twitter perhaps I should try um <laughs> but the people that I know and I'm going to name them some people in the audience may know them are Heidi Snayman who's currently at Gold Associates but she used to work with me at the Water Research Commission in South Africa and she was the most phenomenal mentor. She was incredibly generous with her time. And she knew that I would approach her for how do I deal with this kind of situation type advice. Um, and the other one is a guy by the name of Chris Buckley, who's a professor at the University of Kusulu Natal, um, also in South Africa. And he was the most incredible friend to my PhD supervisor, which is how I met him first. So to begin with, it was more of a coaching relationship. He taught me modeling. He taught me how to use West, for example. But then later on, when I had my, my first academic job, um, I asked him to be the external examiner for one of my courses that, that I used to teach because I liked the way he interacted with students and the way he was always so, again, generous and giving with his knowledge and his time. And I knew he would be that for me in my academic role, much the same as he was for, for students in a teaching role. Um, so in those cases they were they were older than me more recently i've been watching somebody that i met through the young water professionals who is much younger than me but just full of fire and enthusiasm and this massive positive attitude and seeing that things that she was faced with that would make me kind of go oh, no, do i really have to were things that she would really grab with both hands and go I can do it crying or I can do it smiling and I choose to smile and I thought that was just the most amazing attitude to have so she's seven years younger than I am um, her name's Inga Jacobs she now works at IWMI and I think she is the most fantastic role model when it comes to doing things with a smile on your face and making the absolute best of every possible situation and she always jokes that it's because she grew up with brothers, so she was the shortest and she just had to learn to run fastest to keep up. And she just carried that through into her professional life. And I think that's amazing. So some of these people know that I've been, you know, sponging ideas off them. Um, some of them don't. Most of them have been older than me, not all of them. And a mentor is who's whoever you choose it to be. You can approach them and ask if they will act as your mentor and 
you know, if you've chosen wisely, they'll be flattered and willing and happy to do so, as long as they have the time, obviously, and not everybody does. But if they don't have time, that doesn't mean that's the end of the relationship. You can watch and learn and you can ask the odd question if it's someone you have access to. And it's well worth it if you pick a variety of people that show you ways of behaving or attributes or positions that you aspire, aspire to in, in different ways, then take them on as your mentors. They don't have to know. Thanks, Joe. I see there's a question in the chat about that, uh, about finding a mentor, and I hope that helped. <laughs> um, my next question, but we'll come back to it and maybe you can add to some more to it a bit later. My next question is about your goals for the future. Uh, what is your next big career goal or where are you hoping to take your career next? And what advice would you give your mentee if they had the goal you have? Um. When it comes to next big career goal, this is going to sound odd. I don't have one. Um, quite honestly, I am living the dream at the moment. Um, society says that if you're in an organization, then you should seek to climb all its, its the rungs of its ladder and, and move up and all the rest of it. But honestly, the people above me have much more management and administrative responsibilities than I do. And I like the technical side of things. I didn't do my degrees so I could be a manager. I did them so that I could be a scientist. And that's what I love doing. So I, I don't want to move away from that. Um, I have a boatload of technical content in the job that I really enjoy at the moment. I work with people I like, and that makes a massive difference to your daily life. So it's a team I enjoy. And I get to see the impact of the work that I do out there in the world. It actually makes a difference to the environment, environmental health and people's lives. So that that's great. I, lo I love the sector I'm in. So at the moment, I've got a mixture of, of the day job. Um, I do some volunteering. So I'm on the board of a nonprofit company called Rock Blue, which uh, provides financial assistance. No, it doesn't give money. It provides financial advice and governance um, advice and assistance to struggling municipalities that you know, know there's a fund available, but they don't know how to access it or they don't handle their own expenditure properly. Um, and that's a completely different ball game from my day job. So I'm, again, terrifying to say yes to when they ask, but massive learning curve and just, I've learned so much and it's brought benefits that I, I really didn't anticipate. Um, I still volunteer for the International Water Association and for the Water Institute of Southern Africa. And then again, separately, I've got an academic position because I love working with students and particularly postgraduates and doing research. So I've got a visiting post at University of Cape Town. And between those two things, I get to do everything I want. I mean, what more could you ask for? So I don't have a, a next big career goal other than please give me more of the same because this is huge amounts of fun. Um, the second part to your question was, remind me, sorry. Um, well, if you had a goal, how would you advise your mentee to pursue that goal? But since, since you are happy to do more of the same, maybe how would you advise your mentee to do more of the same? I would say think about what it is you really want to do, because no job is all good days. So even if you get the job of your dreams you're gonna have days that you hate and that doesn't mean it's the wrong job, but it does need to get you out of bed with excitement in the mornings. I love Mondays, I, it's a fresh new week and I, I can't wait to get to it and, and get started again and pick up where the last week left off. If you want to get that out of your working life, then you have to think very carefully about whether you want the goals that society tells you you should want. Um, if it's a bigger house and a lot more money and a, a massive car and that's going to make you happy that's fine but I have plenty of friends of, of my age so I would say we're middle career professionals who got all those things and they were things that really drove them through their their teens and 20s and made them make the decisions that they did because they were were driven to aspire to the goals that society says you should aspire to and then when they got them they weren't at all happy and without exception, they've left what they said were the dream jobs that they always wanted and they've gone and done something else. So, you know, I've, perhaps if you go into something like marketing because you genuinely find pleasure 
in doing that, in doing design work and reaching out to the public um, and undertaking marketing for its own satisfaction, that's great. But a friend that I had went into it because she saw it as a route to a really, really fat pay package and it got her there, but she was miserable and she didn't see the value in what she did. So I would say, think about what you want. If you went into science or you went into engineering because you wanted to do science and engineering, then do science and engineering and let it make you happy. Um, and by all means, have a bad day and finish early because you just cannot anymore and go and be very grumpy and have a big ice cream or whatever it is that you need to do, you cheer yourself up. That's fine as long as it's not every day. Um, so yeah, don't follow the carrots that, that people give you. I mean, I've worked for an organization that restructured um, and they created a whole layer of management jobs above me and a few of us in the layer I was in were, were given the adverts and told, you know, you should apply for this. And like a Pavlov's dog, I just kind of got my CV out and started updating it. And then I actually read the job description. I don't want to do any of that. I would hate that. No, thank you. I'm doing science because I want to be a scientist. And when I grow up, I still want to be a scientist. So that's what I'm going to do. Thanks very much, Joe. I think that's uh, incredibly valuable advice. I agree with most of all of that. <laughs> follow, follow your passion. And I'm now going to hand over to Lisa, who's going to give us the Q&A questions from the audience um, to, to end up the ses this session. So over to Lisa. Thank you very much, Jo. Great. Thanks, Rudy. And thanks, Joe. That was all so inspiring and like lots of what I needed to hear today because <laughs> with COVID and with I mean, I love my job too, but like, it's just, you know, you go through these ups and downs and a lot of what you said, like made me feel proud of myself again. So thanks. Um, yeah. So we have four questions in the chat, uh, in the Q and A. So I'll just start with the one that came in first, but I'll ask you to answer these very quickly. Uh, try to be very succinct as we don't have so much time left. Um, so the, the first question that came in, uh, is do you have tips on interacting or taking calls as a smart water newbie? I just got my first job, got lots to learn, but want to make sure I come across professional, even though I'm still learning. Okay. Um, for taking calls, be completely honest. So don't say I'm completely known, I don't know what I'm doing, but say, if you feel like saying it, it's perfectly all right to go. I have more to learn than to contribute to this conversation. Um, or if you don't know the answer to something, just say, I don't know, but I will find out and I'll get back to you. And then actually carry through on what you said you'd do. Yes, very good answer. I'm currently reading Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. And like you are just, I think you're repeating a lot of what she says in this on leadership. So it's great, great advice. Um, next question is the water world seems immense with so many different career paths. What are some of the early career choices we should be looking for to ensure we are at the forefront of the progress in the water sector? Big question. <laughs> Big question and the easy answer is oh almost any of them um the rise of digital technology is really in the news at the moment but none of this is going away for so for as long as we need to drink clean water which we always will and the moment we drink clean water we make sewage out of it and we always will um the broader picture is not going to change so choose the thing that fires you up there's no one particular application or discipline that i can say this is the one that will get you to the front just do the thing that, that makes you passionate and keep doing it. Okay, next question is, do you have any tips on finding a mentor if you're part of a small office? What is the role of a mentor? Look outside your office. Um, my current mentors are not in my day job. They, they're not in my employment at all, but they're in my network. So my tip would be the actually the one I said earlier, volunteer, get involved with an organization like this one, as you are already actually. And it will give you an instant network of colleagues that just don't work for the same employer as you. It doesn't mean they're not your colleagues and it doesn't mean they can't be your mentors. So look outside your own organization. Great advice. And then the last question is, do you have advice for a situation where someone with more experience at your organization gives you negative comments on your work and makes you feel like you're not good enough at the job? How do you deal with this? I'm at my first job for two years now and still learning how to be a researcher. 
it's not going to stop. <laughs> Let me tell you that one now. And it depends what the negative comments are. So if they are negative comments about the work, if somebody says they, they didn't like something you did, then ask them to expand on it and go, what specifically do you not like about it? How would you have preferred me to, how would you have preferred it to have been done? What would you like to see instead? And make them explain why they're being negative. One of the things I tell people in my teams is if you don't have a suggestion, then you don't get to make an objection. So if they come to you and say, I don't like this, not good enough. You can respectfully say, why don't you like this? Please explain to me what it is that, that you would have liked more. If they're negative comments about you personally, then that is out of line. And that's your opportunity to say, I think we should keep the discussion on the topic, on the work. And if it really doesn't stop, then actually you're getting into harassment territory and then you're completely justified in going and speaking to somebody else who's at their level or above their level and saying, I'm receiving personal negative comments and I need help with dealing with them. And you're completely innocent of any wrongdoing on your part there. If somebody's giving you negative feedback, it should be about what you did, not who you are. Thanks. And we have one last question that came in right under the wire. So I'll ask you to answer that and then we'll close the Q&A for now. And the rest of the questions we'll post on LinkedIn and ask you to answer them there. So this last sure. question that just came in is, what would you suggest someone who is on the lookout for their first job and wants to explore working in the smart water sector, especially with the COVID situation? Do you think it would be wise to wait for a role that's too specific? No, absolutely not. Um, I would recommend keeping your eyes wide open for start to start with. So one of the great things about the pandemic, and this is gonna sound awful, is the way so much of life has moved online. So there's a lot more that can be done. Many more companies that said, you know, in the past that this particular job cannot be done from home. It cannot be done remotely. Are suddenly discovering that actually there's an awful lot of things that can be done remotely. So there's no reason to say I shouldn't look for a job now. The best ways to look for them are through the networks that are involved in what you want to do. Um, so things like SWAN, things like LinkedIn, sign up for groups and, and watch out for webinars and seminars. There's a lot happening online and a lot of it is for free. Um, and if you go to something which is a, a webinar or a learning experience and they are asking for volunteers, then volunteer. If they're asking for questions, then ask a question and, and just get yourself noticed so your name pops up in the chat box or or somebody will say, you know, so-and-so asked about X, Y, and Z, and that was a good question. And you start to build up a network um, so that when you make an application, you have a good understanding of what the landscape looks like and who's doing what and roughly how advanced or, or not a particular organisation or individual might be. It's not going to be a surefire recipe that will get you employed within a fortnight, but it will improve your chances of being able to spot the jobs that, that will be what you want them to be. Um, and you finding doors which are open to you because there are loads of doors. You just have to find them. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we have a few more questions that are coming in the Q&A, but as I said, we'll post those on LinkedIn and get you to answer them there live so that Perfect. the community can go back and see them also with along with the recording. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, we have some last minute uh, things to cover here, but then I'll let Rudy close it out. And yeah, we have so many comments coming in the chat that all of your contributions have been super lovely, very helpful, clear crystal contributions and lots of thanks. So I'll just thank you now for now as well <laughs> thank you it's been great yeah great uh, so um i'll just keep going i guess rudy um i'm just quickly going to introduce okay, our next good. uh session thanks again joe it was lovely to have you and sorry to end off with saying we're interviewing somebody else but our next episode will be in february on the 24th and we've got prof uh, andrea cominola from um tu berlin uh, so very exciting to be interviewing um, Andrea next and um, please do sign up for this uh, next episode. We'll be posting the links within the next week on our LinkedIn page and please share with your network as well about our mentorship series. The recording of course of this session will be made available as well. So keep a lookout for that. And now over to Lisa who will be telling you more about the Promised Ambassador program. 
it's extended. <laughs> yeah, so I was kind of hoping for, you know, the transitions here, but it didn't work out in our PowerPoint. So uh, we do have some program ambassador program updates and also, of course, the extension. So we're going to be extending the application uh, process by one week. Uh, we know that it's early in the year. It's January. We've had some requests from our community. And also we've just added in two new elements to the ambassador program. So we want to give you one more week to be able to apply to this fantastic program that we're setting up for you uh, to get involved, as Joe is saying, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, the updates that we have to the ambassador program uh, that have since been updated in the last few weeks that are coming as feedback directly from our community are to have ambassador exclusive training. So what we want to give to you in, in addition to a platform and uh, engaging your network, we also want to give you um, some trainings to be able to do that. So one of them will be a, sh a quick training for from the uh, events manager at Swan Forum on event management. So how to organize sessions like this, what you need to know, kind of a 101 for events organization, online events as well. And also from Swan Forum will be a smart water 101. And we're also going to be asking some of the Swan members to contribute to this. So this is great added value for ambassadors and these are exclusive to our ambassadors. As well, just one thing to note, we will be reducing the accepted ambassadors numbers from 15 to eight. And that is just due to our capacity internally as we are a small team on the leadership team. Uh, so we will have about two people to manage per the, the amount of people on the leadership team because we wanna make sure that we're giving you the utmost attention as our ambassadors and helping you grow and thrive in the smart water community. Um, so apply, the deadline is uh, February 5th, and to apply, you can uh, go to the information on our LinkedIn group and also on the SWAN Forum RISP page. So that's all on our LinkedIn, and you can head over there later. Um, also, I think Shirley now will be sharing a survey for this webinar series in the chat. So if you could please fill that in, that would be fantastic. We would love your feedback to continue improving these these activities that we're giving you and yeah I think I'll hand back over to Rudy to close out. Thanks Lisa and thank you everybody for joining us for this uh, episode number two of the mentorship series and a special thanks to Joe. Um, it's been lovely to have you on the show and I, I learned an incredible amount and as Lisa said it was it was so wholesome hearing what you had to say today. Thank you <laughs> and uh, have a lovely week everyone. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks.